The History of the Early Church Episode 1 Introduction Hello, and welcome to the History of the Early Church. In this podcast, I plan to tell a detailed narrative of early church history from its founding to the Council of Chalcedon in the year 451 AD. I will be taking a detailed narrative approach akin to Mike Duncan's acclaimed The History of Rome. My hope is to share the great stories of the apostles, prophets, bishops, saints, monks, and martyrs which have come down to us in the writings of early Christians. A few more points about the approach of this podcast. One, I will be taking a more traditional approach in the narrative of early church history. That is to say, I will tell the story with the mainstream Catholic or Orthodox Church as the protagonist. Second, the scope of the material will be global. While most of the podcast will be focused on Christians in the Roman Empire, I also want to talk about Christians outside the empire as well especially in places like Mesopotamia, Ethiopia, and the Caucasus. This is the reason why I have chosen the year 451 as my endpoint, because afterwards it becomes much more difficult to tell a coherent narrative. One final note, while much of early Christian history is about the lives of saints and martyrs, it is also about the history and development of Christian theology. As such, I will be covering doctrine, heresy, and theological controversy considerably. I imagine some of you listeners may be a bit apprehensive about this. However, theology in church history is simply unavoidable. My hope is that once these doctrines and heresies are put in their proper historical context, we can gain a better understanding and appreciation for them, and why early Christians were so passionate about what they believed. Before we dive in, I want to cover some of the primary sources I'll be using in this podcast, so you can see where the information is coming from, and maybe even do some studying on your own. First and foremost, there is Eusebius of Caesarea's Ecclesiastical, or Church, history. Eusebius was an early 4th century bishop of Caesarea in Palestine. He is regarded as the founder of church history, as his work is the only narrative source we have covering the first three centuries of the church. In his history, Eusebius extracted hundreds of documents from earlier times to place in his narrative. Many of these texts have only come down to us because of the portions preserved in Eusebius, who had access to a great library in his hometown. Unfortunately, the library of Caesarea was destroyed by Arab invaders in the 7th century. Second, there are the documents which constitute the New Testament. Most importantly for us here is St. Luke's Acts of the Apostles, which provide a narrative of church history in the first three decades during the Age of the Apostles. Third, the writings of early Christians that followed the New Testament, in particular the early church fathers, many of whom will serve as central figures in our story. Fourth, references to Christianity in non-Christian materials, such as the Jewish historian Josephus or the Roman governor Pliny the Younger. There are, of course, many other sources, and you can find lots of the writings mentioned above and more online for free. On the podcast website, I have listed links to where you can learn more about the early church. Well, that's enough of an introduction. Next episode, we'll dive right into church history with the Twelve Apostles in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. I don't yet have a posting schedule worked out. Right now, I am thinking of posting a new episode every two weeks. Thank you for listening. Please comment, rate, and subscribe. And be sure to check out the website at historyoftheearlychurch.wordpress.com. Thank you.
The History of the Early Church Episode 1 Introduction Hello, and welcome to the History of the Early Church. In this podcast, I plan to tell a detailed narrative of early church history from its founding to the Council of Chalcedon in the year 451 A.D., I will be taking a Hello, and welcome to the History of the Early Church. Episode 8, Apostolic Succession. First off, I'd like to thank Dr. Sebastian Brock for helping me with the resources for early Syriac Christianity. For those of you who don't know, Dr. Brock is the world's leading scholar in the English-speaking world on Syriac Christianity. Thank you very much, Dr. Brock, for all your help. Last episode, we dealt with the aftermath of the Neuronian persecution and the Jewish war. Today, we will close out the first century and start the transition from the apostles to the bishops. Unfortunately, our knowledge of church history in the 20 years or so following the temple's destruction in AD 70 is slim. However, that is usually the time most scholars assign the writing of parts of the New Testament. So, without further ado, let's fast forward to the 90s AD. Before we move forward in the narrative, we should take a look at how Christians were worshipping and practicing their faith in the late 1st century. The last time we looked at early Christian worship and practice was in episode 2, about 60 years ago. So how did Christians practice in the late 1st century? When one flips through the New Testament, one looks in vain to find a single document that lays out how the liturgy is done, or how baptism is administered. There are hints and references, but none of the 27 books deals with the issues as their main focus. In place of this void, there is a remarkable document from the late 1st century that actually does lay out Christian praxis. This document's full name is The Lord's Teaching to the Gentiles Through the Twelve Apostles, but is more commonly referred to as the Didache. The Didache is a redaction of various sources from the 1st and early 2nd century. It contains instructions for catechumens, people preparing to be baptized, baptismal and Eucharistic rules, and apocalyptic elements at the end. On a whole, the document is the earliest example of what are called church orders. Church orders are guides and manuals on issues pertaining to church life. The text as it stands originated among Jewish Christians in Syria and shows close affinities to the Gospel of Matthew. The document opens with a discussion of the two ways, which serve as moral instructions for catechumens. Many of Jesus' teachings appear, such as loving and praying for one's enemies, and the two commandments Christ considered the greatest, loving God with all your heart and loving your neighbor as yourself. Some of the most interesting parts occur in the discussion of the liturgy. A catechumen is to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in a river of running water. If running water is not available, then water is to be poured three times on the catechumen's head. Prior to baptism, both the catechumen and the person baptizing them are required to fast in preparation. In discussing fasting, Christians are told to fast on Wednesdays and Fridays, not on Mondays and Thursdays, which was when Pharisees and non-Christian Jews fasted. It also tells Christians to say the Lord's Prayer three times a day. During Sunday worship, prior to taking Holy Communion, Christians are admonished to confess their sins and be reconciled to each other, 
so that their Eucharistic sacrifice may be pure. Only baptized Christians are permitted to take communion. Another feature of the Didache is how it instructs Christians to receive apostles and prophets. Prophets, like our old friend Agabus from episode 3, were still traveling around in the late 1st and early 2nd century. The text also gives criteria for determining if somebody is a true apostle or prophet. The Didache also gives short guidelines for choosing bishops and deacons. It should be noted that at this point, the monarchical episcopacy had not yet taken shape. Finally, the document closes with apocalyptic fervor to be ready. The Lord may return at any moment. With that fascinating snapshot into the praxis of early Christians, let us move on in the narrative. Unfortunately for the Christians in the Roman Empire, another persecutor ascended the imperial throne. Titus Flavius Domitianus was the younger brother of the Emperor Titus, the same Titus who destroyed the Jewish temple in AD 70. For the details about Domitian, I refer you once again to Mike Duncan's The History of Rome, episodes 75 to 77. Domitian demanded he be addressed as Dominus Deus, Latin for Lord God. Therefore, it isn't surprising that, like Caligula, he came into conflict with Monotheus. Since the destruction of the temple, a new tax had been imposed on the empire's Jews, known as the Fiscus Judaicus. Ironically, the revenue generated from the tax went towards the temple of Jupiter Capitolinus in Rome. Unlike his predecessors, Domitian was far more forceful in making Jews pay up. Concerning Christians, there is little evidence he enacted any sort of organized persecution. As I said in the previous episode, emperors wouldn't do that until the 3rd century. However, Domitian's actions would lead to him being remembered as a second Nero by both Christians and non-Christians. The Roman historian Cassius Dio offers some tantalizing evidence that Domitian targeted Christians. A cousin of Domitian's, the consul Flavius Clemens, was executed in AD 96 on charges of atheism and practicing Jewish customs. Clemens's wife was also banished on the same charges. Naturally, later Christians saw the consul and his wife as martyrs. While this is certainly possible, it cannot be proven. During this time of hardship, problems flared up again for the church in a familiar spot. Perhaps it doesn't come as a surprise that at this time, the Corinthian church once again fell into disarray. If you remember back in episode 5, Paul had had a major conflict with the Corinthian church over all sorts of issues. The apostle to the Gentiles actually had to write up to four epistles to them. This time, rebellious factions rose up in Corinth and forcefully deposed their leaders, causing a schism. The event was such a scandal that even pagans were taken aback by it. Soon, word of this misfortune reached the church in Rome. The last time we visited the Roman church was during the Neronian persecution when the apostles Peter and Paul were martyred. Twenty years later, the memory of their deaths were still in the minds of Roman parishes. At this point, the ecclesiastical leadership in Rome, like in the Didache, had not yet crystallized into the monarchical bishopric. Rather, the Roman believers were led by a council of presbyters. The terms presbyter and bishop were still being used interchangeably. Among the Roman presbyters was a certain Clement who wrote an epistle on behalf of the Roman church to the Corinthians. Clement of Rome was a disciple of Peter and Paul. Almost nothing is known about him, but he was later reckoned as one of the earliest bishops of Rome, usually numbered as the fourth after Peter. More likely, Clement was probably the first among the Roman presbytery. He is sometimes identified with the Clement mentioned by Paul in Philippians 4.3. Clement sent as his response a long and wonderful epistle. 
This epistle is the earliest Christian document outside the New Testament we can be certain of. Clement opens his epistle by reminding the Corinthians how wonderful their community was prior to the schism. Envy and jealousy were the cause of their sin. And so Clement demonstrates how envy and jealousy had brought great evil into the world. He starts with the example of Cain and Abel and continues through the Old Testament down to the very martyrdoms of Peter and Paul just 30 years earlier. He called the Corinthians to remember Christ's saving blood and their need to turn back to God. Clement constantly quotes the Old Testament as holy scripture. The continuity between the Old and New Covenants is incredibly strong in Clement's epistle. God's admonitions to Israel were his admonitions to his church. Just as Israel had priests and Levites, so the church had bishops and deacons. Just as Israel had regulated sacrifices and services, so did the church. As the Israelite tribes quarreled over the Aaronic priesthood, so the Corinthians quarreled over the office of bishop. Clement reminded the Corinthians that their bishops were appointed by the apostles as leaders of local parishes. The apostles gave them the authority to succeed them in their sacred ministry, lead local communities, and offer the Eucharist. Because the church is God's chosen people, they need to be holy, righteous, and loving. The Corinthian laity were called to submit to their presbyters for correction and reproof. He reminded them to fear God, their loving Heavenly Father. God may discipline his children, but he does so out of love. Towards the end, Clement has strong words for those who refuse to heed what God has spoken through the Roman church's epistle. He then offers intercessory prayer on behalf of the Corinthians. He ends the epistle by asking for a speedy return of the Roman delegates from Corinth and a prayer of praise to God and Jesus Christ. Clement's epistle successfully healed the Corinthian community. The text was so highly revered that many Christians went so far as to consider it holy scripture. It also shows the growing prominence the church in Rome had in the wider Christian world. The epistle to the Corinthians is the only authentic writing by Clement of Rome. There are quite a few ancient Christian texts wrongly attributed to him. An early 2nd century homily, commonly called Second Clement, two epistles addressed to Christian virgins, and finally, the Pseudo-Clementines, which are composed in two parts, the Clementine homilies, which are the work of heretical Jewish Christians, and the Clementine recognition, a legendary biography of Clement's life. Personally, I encourage all of you listeners to read Clement's wonderful epistle for yourselves. The reign of Domitian was hard on both Christians in Rome and in Corinth. Clement empathized with the Corinthians in his epistle. But by far the strongest evidence for persecution under Domitian is the Apocalypse of John, also known as the Book of Revelation. Now, before I proceed, I should note that there are good arguments for dating the Apocalypse to Nero's reign. The book appears to say that the Jewish temple is still standing, and the identification of the beast and his number 666 with Nero Caesar is highly likely. Also, the judgment and fall of Babylon and the wars associated with the beast have many touch points with the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. For the sake of this episode, I will follow the conventional chronology, which has John writing the book under Domitian. Nonetheless, the date of the apocalypse is an interesting question, so I thought I'd throw it out there. At some point late in Domitian's reign, John the son of Zebedee was exiled to the island of Patmos. At least, I'm saying it was John the son of Zebedee. There are reasons to think that the writer of Revelation was simply a presbyter from Asia Minor, not the apostle. For the sake of convenience, I'm saying it's the apostle. But again, I encourage all of you to look in the matter for yourself. It was on the island of Patmos that um, John encountered Jesus Christ in a vision, albeit a bizarre and frightening vision. 
The Lord directed him to write to Christians in Asia Minor, where many were undergoing tribulation. The book addresses churches in seven cities, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. To the church of Ephesus, the capital of Asia, John, or more accurately Jesus speaking through John, praised them for enduring the ills that had befallen them and resisting the false apostles and the new heretical movement known as the Nicolaites. We have virtually no information concerning the doctrine of the Nicolaites. A certain reading of Revelation may suggest they advocated some sort of sexually promiscuous lifestyle, but this could easily be allegorical, akin to how the Old Testament describes Israel as an adulteress when she worships other gods. However, there are some later fathers that suggest the Nicolaites taught an eschatology which amounted to a great eternal orgy. The founder of the sect is usually identified as the deacon Nicholas. Besides that, there is nothing known about this early heresy. The Ephesians were faulted, though, for not being as loving as they had been. They needed to repent, do good works, and return to their loving selves. The church in Smyrna was commended for not behaving like the false Jews, i.e., Jews who rejected the truth from the Christian perspective. The oppression Christians were receiving at the hands of non-Christian Jews probably had something to do with Domitian pressing the Fiscus Judaicus so hard. As such, the Smyrnian Jewish Christians were the true Jews, the righteous remnant of Israel, an indicator that by the late first century, many Christians in Asia Minor still thought of themselves as Jewish. Christ also encouraged them that despite persecution, including imprisonment, if they persevered to the end, he would reward them with the crown of life. Another interesting fact is that at this time, if our chronologies are accurate, the Church of Smyrna was being led by their bishop, Polycarp, whom we shall all come to know and love. Pergamum was the city that was home to a massive altar to Zeus, which is probably the throne of Satan referenced in Revelation 2.13. The fact that these Christians were in a strongly pagan city is reinforced by the mention of a holy martyr named Antipas. While no one in Pergamum had conceded to paganism by denying the faith, they had conceded to heresy by allowing the Nicolaites to teach in their midst. Thus, Christ called them to repent of the heresy and return to apostolic teaching. Three of the other four cities were falling short the most. For the Christians in Thyatira, Christ had one simple message. Stop tolerating the false prophetess Jezebel. For the faithful in Sardis, their good works were imperfect, and the believers had a facade of piety, but no real life in them. Yet, there were a few faithful Christians in Sardis who could hopefully lead their church to repentance. Laodicea also had spiritual failings. Their faith was weak and non-committal. On the other hand, the Philadelphian church was praised for enduring false Jews like the Smyrnians. The rest of Revelation is an exciting cosmic drama about the end times, and so I recommend reading and researching it for yourself. While not everyone always finds it the most spiritually rewarding book, no one can say The Apocalypse of John is not interesting reading. The bizarreness of the book's content would cause it to have a hard time making the New Testament canon cut. But we'll see that in a later episode. At some point late in his reign, Domitian's characteristic paranoia caused him to seek out members of the House of David in Judea. This obviously included relatives of Jesus himself, who were the leaders of the Jewish mother church. Domitian had the grandsons of Jesus' brother Judas rounded up and brought before him. The emperor interrogated them and discovered they were simple land-working folk. 
who obviously didn't have the resources to start a rebellion. He also asked them about Christ's kingdom, which they told him was heavenly and would not appear until the end of time. The fact that these members of David's house believed in a heavenly and non-earthly messianic kingdom caused a mission to realize the Christians had no political ambitions. Well, at least on earth. And so he promptly dismissed them as fools and withdrew any active persecution against the church. If he was even actively persecuting the church to begin with. Domitian was assassinated in AD 96 and the old Nerva assumed the throne and was subsequently succeeded by Trajan two years later. See the History of Rome, episodes 78 to 80 for their reigns. Under Nerva, John returned to Ephesus. A story that has come down to us, it may be legendary, says that when John returned to Ephesus, he was beseeched by various churches to help them organize and appoint bishops for their communities. At Smyrna, John left a young Christian man in the care of the local bishop, presumably our friend Polycarp. But the young man, despite the bishop's care, fell into grave sin and apostasy, eventually becoming the leader of a gang of bandits. John returned to discover what had happened to the boy and set off to find him. When the apostle arrived at the place the young man was, the bandits seized him. John did not resist, but stated that he had come simply to see their leader. When the young man saw John, he was ashamed and fled. Despite his age, John ran after him and boldly expressed his love for the young man, saying how he would suffer on his behalf, even go so far as to give his own life for him, and that he would testify on behalf of him before Christ himself. After hearing his old spiritual father's words, the young man fell down and wept. John embraced him with loving arms. After that, the apostle brought him back to the church and guided him on the road to repentance. It was during John's last years that three heretical sects sprouted up. The Ebionites, the Cerinthians, and the Docetus. These three groups represent the range of early heresy. On the right, you have Judaizers, and on the left, you had early Gnostics. We have already discussed the Judaizers, but the Gnostics are a new phenomenon, at least for us. Since I plan to devote an upcoming episode to discuss Gnosticism, I'm only going to give information that is necessary. The Ebionites were Judaizers. They believed that both Jews and Gentiles needed to keep the Mosaic Torah to be justified. But in addition to this heresy, they also believed that Jesus, while Messiah, was not the divine word and wisdom of the Father made flesh. They taught that Jesus had been born naturally by Joseph and Mary, not the virginal conception by the Holy Spirit. The only scripture we know for sure they held to was a Gospel of the Hebrews, which may have been the original Aramaic Gospel of Matthew. As you can probably guess, they completely rejected Paul and his epistles. There are, are traditions, as I mentioned in the previous episode, that connect the origin of the Ebionites with the disgruntled Thebothus, the man who lost out to Simeon for the bishopric of Jerusalem, as well as the Jewish Christians who stayed in Pella when Simeon led the church back to the holy city. On the other side of the heresy scale were the Docetists. Docetism was an early form of what is commonly called Gnosticism. In basic, Gnosticism posits a dualist cosmos between a higher material spiritual world and the evil or inferior or irrelevant material world. Spirit good, matter bad. The spiritual world was home to the real supreme deity and the material world was created by a lesser being. The main heresy of the Docetists was Christological. Whereas the Ebionites denied the divinity of Jesus, the Docetists denied his humanity, in keeping with their view that matter was inferior. <laughs> 
The third heretical sect was the Cerinthians. This group took its name from its founder, Cerinthus. Cerinthus' doctrines represent an odd mixture of the two aforementioned groups. On the one hand, Cerinthus taught that there was a spiritual being called Christ and a different human fleshly person called Jesus. At Jesus' baptism, Christ came down in the form of a dove from the Supreme God and descended on Jesus the man. It was Christ, through the fleshly Jesus, that performed the miracles, before finally leaving the human Jesus to die on the cross and rise again. This was the Gnostic side of Cerinthus. On the more Judaic side, he taught, like the Ebionites, that Jesus, the fleshly man, was not virgin born. He also taught that in the end times there would be a literal millennial kingdom in Jerusalem that would consist of all sorts of lustful orgies, drinking, and physical pleasures. There is also evidence he taught animal sacrifice would be resumed in the end times. Because of his millennial teachings, some later believed Cerinthus was the real author of Revelation. The controversy in the early church over how to understand the thousand years we will explore in future episodes. The Johannine writings of the New Testament appear to be responding to all these groups. Hence, the Gospel of John is strong in its Eucharistic language about Jesus' flesh and blood being real, contra the docetist. In his epistles, John defines an antichrist as one who teaches Jesus Christ has not truly become human. Against the Ebionites, the Gospel of John also not only emphasizes the humanity, but also the divinity of Jesus, as the word of God the Father made flesh. At one point, John himself went to the local public baths, probably with Polycarp, and found that Cerinthus was there. Immediately, John left and said, Let us fly, lest even the bathhouse fall down, because Cerinthus, the enemy of truth, is within. John died presumably in Ephesus around the year AD 100. The historical record disagrees as to whether he died peacefully or was martyred by non-Christian Jews. The former is more commonly thought to be true. He was the last living apostle. In the New Testament, John ranks second to Paul in terms of documents attributed to him. A gospel, three epistles, and of course, revelation. Historically, the gospel and the first epistle have been regarded as authentic. The second and third epistles, as well as Revelation, were disputed in the early church, but were eventually accepted. Modern scholarship is, as usual, divided on the question of Johannine authorship. There are also various apocryphal documents attributed to John that arose in the second century. The death of the last of Jesus' original twelve followers brings us to the close of the first century. No one who had actually seen Jesus Christ in the flesh would be there anymore to guide the church. So who would guide the church? The answer was the bishops. Back in episode 6, I noted how eventually the leadership of the church would transition from the apostles to the bishops as the successors of the apostles. The terms episcopos and presbyteros, which in English are usually rendered bishop and priest, were used interchangeably in the New Testament to denote the same office. The early churches appeared to have had a council of presbyters under the apostles. The apostles set up these men as leaders of local parishes. We have already encountered two of these men, Clement and Polycarp. Clement was a follower of Peter and Paul and a leader of the Roman church. Polycarp sat at the very feet of the apostle John and learn from him the faith he received from Christ. With the apostles now gone, leaders in every city would need to step in and fill the void. The terms episcopos and presbyteros gradually began to be separated, the former denoting the higher office, 
In doing so, the bishops would maintain the earlier ecclesiastical hierarchy in the sub-apostolic period. The writers of this generation, such as Clement and Polycarp, are conventionally dubbed the Apostolic Fathers, the first church fathers who received their faith from the apostles themselves. Next episode, we will get into the early 2nd century and see how the church dealt with persecution and heresy in a world without the apostles. Thank you for listening. Please comment, review, and subscribe. And be sure to visit the website at History of the Early Church. Welcome to the History of the Early Church. Episode 9, Fathers, Martyrs, and Apologists. Last episode, we looked at the church during the last days of the Apostle John at the close of the first century. Today, we begin the second century and continue along the transition from the Apostles to their successors. The first person we shall discuss is Ignatius, the Bishop of Antioch. Ignatius had been a disciple of John and Peter, and was also thoroughly acquainted with Paul's epistles. In AD 107, he was arrested and sent off to Rome to be martyred, possibly in the Colosseum. The exact circumstances of his arrest are unknown, and later accounts of his martyrdom are unreliable. After his arrest, the soldiers took him to Smyrna, where he visited his good friend Polycarp, the local bishop. While there, Ignatius wrote epistles to the churches of Ephesus, Magnesia, and Tralles. After leaving Smyrna, he was taken to Troas, where he wrote more epistles to the churches of Philadelphia, Smyrna, as well as a personal letter to Polycarp himself. Ignatius intended his letters to give strength and support to the Christians in Asia Minor, and to combat heresy. Both the Judaizers and the Docetists were still active at this time, threatening the purity of the apostolic faith. As a quick refresher, the Docetists were proto-Gnostics, who taught Jesus Christ was divine but only appeared to be human, his flesh merely a facade. In response, Ignatius says this about Christ. There is one physician who is possessed of both flesh and spirit, both made and not made, God existing in flesh, true life in death, both of Mary and of God, first passable and then impassable, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Ignatius, like the Apostle John before him, argues heavily for the reality of Jesus' incarnation, that God truly did become flesh. There is one Lord, Jesus Christ, who is both eternal and created, both deity and human. Ignatius relates events such as Jesus' birth to Mary, his passion under Pilate, and of course his crucifixion and resurrection. All historical events in time undergone by the one who is truly man, not a phantom as the docetists taught. Ignatius goes even further. He states how his own suffering and coming martyrdom at the mouths of wild beasts in Rome would be for nothing if Christ had not set the example first. He also notes how the docetists abstain from taking communion. They reject that the Eucharist is truly the flesh of Jesus as a consequence of rejecting the Incarnation. Ignatius also exhorts the Christians of Asia Minor to be faithful to their bishops. Indeed, he states how the bishop is to be reverenced like Christ himself. However, for Ignatius, the bishops are not the successors of the apostles. Instead, the apostles are part of the heavenly hierarchy, which is typologically replicated by the church's ministers on earth. 
On the one hand, there is God the Father, His Son and Word, Jesus Christ, and the Apostles. On the other hand, there is the bishop, his priests, and the deacons. The bishop is to be obeyed, and nothing in the church's parish life is to be done without his authority, or the priests he delegates, especially the Eucharist and the Agape feasts. Ignatius is the first witness to many things in the early church. He is the first writer to refer to the church as Catholicos, or Catholic, meaning universal and whole. He is the first to explicitly delineate the threefold hierarchy in the church of bishop, priest, and deacon. He is also, therefore, the first to explicitly differentiate the episcopos from the presbyteros as two distinct offices, one superior to the other. The other group Ignatius needed to combat were the Judaizers. Interestingly enough, the Judaizers here are probably Gentiles, not Jews. These Gentile Judaizers most likely were guilty of trying to impose aspects of Mosaic law such as Sabbath observance, or giving the Old Testament a higher authority than the teachings of Jesus himself. For Ignatius, this preaching of, quote, Judaism ran counter to the Lord's grace Christians had received. Interestingly enough, though, he includes some Jewish Christians as being among those who hold to the true faith, even while drawing a clearer distinction between Judaism and the Gospel. Ignatius' epistle to the Roman Christians is perhaps his most emotional. The bishop looked forward to seeing them, but pleaded with them not to interfere with his coming martyrdom. The bishop eagerly awaited his passion, desiring to suffer as Christ suffered, to die as the Lord died. For Ignatius, only now was he beginning to be a true disciple. Just as the Corinthians accorded the Roman church a high regard, so too did Ignatius. He states that the Roman church presides over in love. Unlike his other six epistles, the letter to the Romans is not addressed to the local bishop. As we saw earlier with Clement, the Roman church, unlike Jerusalem, Antioch, or the churches of Asia, had not yet transitioned into the more centralized episcopacy. The details of the final fate of this holy man are unknown. He was brought to Rome and eaten alive, presumably, by wild animals, perhaps in the Colosseum itself, in the year A.D. 107. Not long after Ignatius' martyrdom, his friend and fellow bishop Polycarp was asked by the Church of Philippi for help. Polycarp was one of the most highly regarded bishops of the early church, especially because he learned the faith by sitting at the very feet of the Apostle John. In his epistle, he defends Orthodox teaching against heretics, but couples this with righteous behavior. The faithful in Philippi were having problems dealing with a greedy priest named Valens. For Polycarp, right doctrine and right behavior were bound together, and vice versa. The Bishop of Smyrna is also known to have written other epistles, but only this one survives. We will leave Polycarp for now, as we will encounter him again in a future episode. Another disciple of John and friend of Polycarp was Papias. He was the bishop of Herapolis in Asia Minor. Herapolis was the place where the apostle Philip and his two prophesying daughters had been buried. Papias wrote a five-book work entitled Exegesis of the Sayings of the Lord, which unfortunately has only survived in fragments. Papias is an interesting figure for many reasons. He not only knew John, but also received information from the disciples of other apostles. He used these oral traditions to interpret scripture. He even had oral traditions that contained sayings of Jesus not found in the four Gospels. One of Papias' most controversial beliefs was his view on the millennium in Revelation. For Papias, the end times would contain a literal 1,000-year earthly kingdom, what is often called chiliasm. He believed that the Old Testament prophecies of bounty would be fulfilled by this. 
The debate over how to understand John's 1,000 years would continue well into the 4th century. Other fragments of his writings give tantalizing bits of information about how early Christians viewed the text that would eventually make up the New Testament. When we discuss the early Christian canon, Papias' statements on this will be explored in more detail. Continuing on in the region of Asia Minor, in 112 AD, the Roman governor of Bithynia Pontus, Pliny the Younger, wrote a letter to the Emperor Trajan asking for advice on how to handle the growing Christian population. The letter had been prompted by locals coming to him and complaining about this strange new cult. The locals had also handed him an anonymous pamphlet with the names of alleged Christians. The complaints probably came from local butchers and people who sold animals for the purpose of pagan sacrifice. Pliny notes how many of the pagan temples had been abandoned because of the growth of Christianity. The Roman governor was not familiar with Christians and so wasn't exactly sure how to deal with them. The governor decided to make the accused take a test. He asked them to invoke the names of Rome's deities, offer wine and incense to statues of Trajan and the gods, and curse Christ. Among those accused were professing Christians, people who used to be but were no longer Christians, and people who denied ever being Christians. For those who refused to sacrifice and renounce Christ, Pliny had them martyred, except for Roman citizens whom he sent off to the capital. People who never were Christians gladly sacrificed. Those who were Christian apostates were released by Pliny after they sacrificed. Nonetheless, Christian apostates created a problem for Pliny. Should they still be punished? Pliny decided to write to the Emperor Trajan for advice. See. Pliny had discovered information about Christianity from the apostates, as well as from torturing two deaconesses. He was surprised. Despite all the horrible things Pliny had heard about this strange new religion, he discovered that Christians committed no real crimes like cannibalism or adultery. They simply held to beliefs which were abhorrently superstitious. Trajan responded by telling Pliny that he had followed the right course. The former Christians who sacrificed were to be given full pardon. The change of heart, not past actions, is what mattered. Christians should not be actively sought out, and anonymous pamphlets lead to tyranny and injustice. Trajan obviously did not want people using false accusations of Christianity to attack their neighbors. So what exactly was illegal about being a Christian? Simply, the name itself. Being a Christian meant gross superstition and impiety. Remember back in episode 7 when I talked about the Pax Deorum? In future episodes, we will discuss the slanders and criticisms particular pagan writers believed about Christianity and how this affected the church. Three years after Pliny's correspondence with Trajan, another Jewish revolt exploded within the Eastern Empire. Jews throughout Cyrene, Mesopotamia, Cyprus, and Egypt rose up and began in mass slaughtering thousands of Gentiles throughout the Eastern Empire. The revolts were eventually put down. What effect this had on the church is difficult to know, but it seems likely that the early Alexandrian community suffered as a result. As I mentioned back in episode 6, the Alexandrian church is largely invisible to historians until the late 2nd century. Because the early Alexandrian Christians would have been of Jewish background, it is not hard to see how these revolts and the subsequent Roman retribution would have reduced Christianity in Egypt. In 117 AD, Trajan was succeeded by Hadrian. Like his predecessor, Hadrian also dealt with the legal question concerning Christians. And once again, the question came from Asia Minor. In 123 AD, the Roman proconsul of Asia Minor, Serenius Granianus, wrote to Hadrian concerning Christians. Like in Pliny's case, there had been a local outburst against Christians, and the pagans demanded their governor do something about it. By the time Hadrian replied, the following year, a new proconsul was in Asia, Gaius Minucius Fundanus. The emperor's reply to Fundanus was, 
despite the positive spin later Christian apologists would put on it, upheld the same legal positions as Trajan. By the way, speaking of said Christian apologists, it was during the reign of Hadrian when the earliest of these men began to write. Slanderous accusations by pagans and Jews, along with persecution, prompted many Christians of the sub-apostolic period to take up their pens and defend the church. Under Hadrian, three of these men wrote, and another was converted. Not long after the rescript to Fundanus, Hadrian visited Athens to participate in the Eleusian Mysteries. Subsequently, some pagans took this as an opportunity to trouble the local Christians. In response, two apologists wrote works addressed to the emperor himself, Quadratus and Aristides. Little is known about Quadratus, but he appears to have been a disciple of the apostles. In the single tiny fragment of his work, Quadratus contrasts the work of the Christian savior with another savior, perhaps Hadrian himself. He emphasizes that Jesus' miracles were real and happened in the history on earth. He also states that some of the persons Jesus had healed had survived to his own time. If I had to speculate, I think that said persons were the children that Christ is said to have healed in the Gospels, such as the daughter of Jarius. The second apologist, Marcianus Aristides, was an Athenian philosopher. In his apology, Aristides divides mankind into four races, barbarians, Greeks, Jews, and Christians. The barbarians made the mistake of worshipping creation and not the creator. The deities of the Greeks were immoral and prone to human weakness. The Jews worshipped the true God, but they misplaced their emphasis in ritualistic law rather than on the worship of the Lord. Hence, Christians alone bear the fullness of truth. It seems doubtful this text ever reached the emperor. One final note, it is possible that Aristides actually wrote later and addressed his work not to Hadrian, but to his successor, Antoninus Pius. The last apologist is difficult to date. It is an epistle addressed to one Diognetus. Diognetus was probably a high-ranking Roman citizen, perhaps even connected to the imperial family, who requested information about the church from his Christian friend. Who was this Christian friend? We don't know. But there is a theory that the epistle to Diognetus is none other than the rest of Quadratus' apology, and that Diognetus was Hadrian himself. Finally, during the reign of Hadrian, a young man from Samaria also converted to Christianity. In time, he would become one of its greatest apologists. I am talking, of course, about Justin Martyr, a man who we will be discussing in detail in the future. The church was clearly growing in the time of the Antonines. Hadrian had issued a rescript that, while it did not legalize Christianity, it also reaffirmed the status Trajan had laid down. Some scholars think that because of Hadrian's religious policies of promoting philosophical schools, some Christians saw this as an opportunity for the church to find a place in the elite intellectual culture of the Greek East. During Hadrian's reign, at least one and possibly two apologists had written to him personally. Based on all this, you may start to get the feeling that Christians could have higher hopes during Hadrian's reign. If you are a Christian in, say, Jerusalem, then you are about to be in for a very rude awakening. Next episode, we will journey back to Judea and look at the situation of the Jewish mother church, her relationship to her fellow Jews, and how the worlds of both would be utterly transformed by yet another Jewish war against Rome. Thank you for listening. Please comment, review, and subscribe. You can email me at historyoftheearlychurch at gmail.com, and don't forget to check out the website at historyoftheearlychurch.wordpress.com.
Episode 10, Jews Not for Jesus. Last episode, we looked at how the Apostolic Fathers and early apologists like Ignatius and Aristides dealt with heresy, persecution, and parish life. We also saw how the emperors themselves handled the legal question of the church. In this episode, we return to the Holy Land. In 132 AD, another great revolt against the Roman Empire broke out in Judea. This war was even larger than the previous revolt. Simon bar Kosaba was hailed as Messiah by many rabbis in Judea. For the next three years, he waged war against Rome and set up a kingdom. But before we dive into that conflict, we need to take a few steps back to examine the state of the Jerusalem church on the eve of the revolt. As I noted back in episode 7, after James's martyrdom, his cousin Simeon bar Cleopas was made bishop of Jerusalem. The Jerusalem church fled the city during the first Judean revolt and migrated to Pella on the other side of the Jordan. Now I need to make a few corrections here. Simeon was more likely made bishop shortly after James was murdered, not when the community decided to leave Pella to return home. Furthermore, the Hebrew mother church likely stayed in Pella since Jerusalem was an uninhabited smoldering pile of ruins. Therefore, Simeon was bishop of Jerusalem in exile. To refresh, a man named Thebothus, because he was not chosen as bishop, began to try to corrupt the church, and most likely some sort of doctrinal schism occurred between him and Simeon. Some scholars suggest that this schism lies at the origins of the two groups of Jewish Christians that appear in subsequent history, the Nazarenes and the Ebionites, whom I shall discuss later. Nonetheless, while Simeon and the family of Jesus were still around, heretics could do very little to poison the Hebrew mother church. The Jerusalem community and the other native Jewish Christians of the Holy Land, particularly in Galilee, had a strong sense of their identity. They were Israel's righteous remnant, led by the family of the Messiah himself. Their fellow Judeans had failed to heed the Messiah's words and warnings, and thus failed in their war against Rome. Among the Jewish groups that survived the first war, the Jerusalem church had a clear understanding and coherent theology for a faith without a physical temple. The true Messiah had come, fulfilled the prophecies of the Hebrew scriptures, and predicted the destruction of the temple, as both a divine judgment and a vindication of himself. Their fellow Israelites needed to repent and recognize the true Messiah. As we saw in episode 7, the rabbis, heirs of the Pharisees, were also producing a theology for a temple-less Judaism. The actions of the rabbis in defining a new Jewish orthodoxy would do much in the way of separating the church from Judaism. Again, to refresh, in the late first century, the rabbis held a council in Jamnia, which forbid the Septuagint and the new Christian scriptures. Christians, Jewish or Gentile, were to be cursed in the synagogues, the so-called benediction of the heretics. Rabbi Gamaliel II is said to have ordered this curse to be recited three times a day. Gamaliel was also held as Nasi, or Patriarch, Prince, of the Jewish people, much to the chagrin of the descendants of King David, like Jesus' family. Another rabbi at this time, Tarpon, is supposed to have said he would rather flee to a pagan temple than enter the house of a Christian. The Christian scriptures, the texts which would become the New Testament, Tarpon is recorded to have said he would burn, even if God's name was written in them. Indeed, the great rabbi Akiba declared damnation for any Jew who dare to read any Christian books. Simeon may have been a great Jewish leader, but his contemporaries, Ben Zakkai, Gamaliel II, and Akiba were determined enemies. When they met at Jamnia, the rabbis were only a small group with little influence, but eventually they would come to lead and define the Jewish faith. <laughs>
Rabbinic tradition records an intriguing account about these times. One day, Rabbi Eliezer ben Harkanus was walking along the main street of Sephoris, where he met a Jewish Christian, Jacob of Kephar Siknin. Jacob shared some teachings with Eliezer, probably the Gospel. The rabbinic source states that Jacob spoke in the name of Yeshu ben Pantiri. More on that name later. Eliezer actually liked what he heard, and even repeated it. Before he knew it, he was charged with heresy, or more accurately, Christianity, and brought before the Roman magistrate. Eliezer was released, but the event horrified him. Why was he arrested? Then it came to him. He had not only allowed himself to listen to the teachings of a Christian, but he had even conversed with said Christian. Worst of all, Eliezer actually liked what he heard, so much so he repeated it. Later, Eliezer is recorded as saying, Let a man always flee from what is disgusting, and from that which resembles what is disgusting. The story illustrates many teaching lessons the rabbis wish to convey to their followers. Christianity is disgusting. Christians are to be avoided. Don't even let yourself hear them speak. Christianity is not only a disgusting heresy, but illegal. The Roman imperial authorities may punish you for it, even if you are a great rabbi. The rabbis were determined to drive a big hulking wedge between the accursed followers of Jesus and themselves. The positive side of this story is that Eliezer before he was disciplined for his crime, actually liked what he heard from Jacob. He actually found Christian teaching pleasing, something that horrified himself and his colleagues. Another negative facet of this story is the reference to Jesus as Yeshu ben Pantiri. The name is a double insult to Jesus himself. Yeshua is Jesus' actual Semitic name, whereas Yeshu is a Hebrew acronym that curses him. The son of Pantiri is a reference to one of the rabbinic slurs about Jesus' family. That Jesus was not virgin born, but the product of an adulterous affair between Mary and a Roman soldier named Pantera. Over the next few centuries, the rabbis would further develop a sort of counter-narrative to the Christian gospel, which attacked Jesus personally. We will explore this in the future. Simeon was eventually martyred around the same time as Ignatius of Antioch. Just as Domitian, when he investigated Jews' grandsons, Trajan too was concerned about Davidic messianism. Some of the followers of Thebothus accused Simeon of being a Davidic descendant. The schismatics were themselves Davidites, and so were probably trying to both get revenge on Simeon and avoid persecution. Upon hearing this about Simeon, the Roman governor of Judea, Atticus, ordered the Hebrew bishop to be tortured. At this time, Simeon was alleged to have been 120 years old the Torah's limit on human life, and the age of Moses. In rabbinic tradition, Ben Zakkai and Akiba were also said to have lived this long, further reflecting the rivalry between these two Jewish groups. Despite his extreme old age, Simeon endured all the torment Atticus laid upon him. Simeon's endurance bore witness and amazed all, even Atticus himself, the governor finally had had enough and ordered the Israelite saint to be crucified. And so, Simeon bar Cleopas, cousin of the Messiah, heir of James the Righteous, and bishop of Jerusalem for over 40 years, earned the crown of martyrdom. After Simeon's death, leadership of the Jerusalem church fell into the hands of a certain justice. The sources here, though, present a problem. Between Simeon's martyrdom, about the year 107, and the end of the Second Jewish War, 
135, 13 Hebrew bishops are said to have reigned in this 28-year period, which would make them all, on average, bishops for only two years each. This seems dubious. Were they all just very short-lived? What's going on here? A convincing explanation put forward by Richard Baucom is that Justice was the actual presiding bishop, and the other twelve bishops formed something of a council. Now that we are finally caught up, it's time to return to AD 132, when the Second Jewish-Roman War began. Rabbi Akiba came to believe that a man named Simon bar Kosiba was possibly the Messiah, and so changed his name from bar Kosiba to bar Kokba, meaning Son of the Star, a reference to the Messianic prophecy in Numbers 24, 17. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. If you want a more detailed account of the war, see episode 83 of Mike Duncan's The History of Rome. May his bones be crushed. As far as we are concerned, Barcopa rebelled in 132 AD and ruled Judea as Nasi, or Prince, for three more years until Hadrian's legions finally defeated him. The causes of the war are disputed. Hadrian at some point refounded Jerusalem as a new Roman colony. Aelia Capitolina, a pagan city. A temple to Jupiter was built on the Temple Mount, and circumcision was outlawed. Were these measures taken before or after the revolt? Personally, I am inclined to think before, and so these measures provide the catalyst for Barcopa's war. The results of this war for the Hebrew Mother Church were catastrophic. The first of these consequences was Bar Kokhba's persecution of Jewish believers. The reason for Bar Kokhba's persecution were probably twofold. On the one hand, it was Akiba and the rabbis who backed his messianic claims, and we all know how the rabbis felt about the church. Second, Bar Kokhba believed himself to be God's messiah which in effect meant that to not support his war, or to acknowledge his claim as Messiah, was treason against the nation of Israel. The church did both. The Christians of Judea, just as in the first revolt, did not participate in the war, and the Jewish Christians already acknowledged Jesus of Nazareth as Israel's promised king. In the eyes of the rabbis and their Messiah, Jewish Christians were the worst of traitors. Bar Kokhba took severe actions against any Jew who did not support him. Remember how zealous Paul had been to persecute the church back in episode 2? Dissident Israelites were worse than pagans themselves. Christians, particularly in Galilee, suffered greatly. Bar Kokhba ordered that unless Christians denied Jesus was the Messiah, he would subject them to cruel punishments. An apocryphal Christian text, the Apocalypse of Peter, appears to have been written by a Jewish believer during Bar Kokhba's persecution. The text portrays the Jewish Christians as the righteous remnant of Israel, the true heirs of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Bar Kokhba is viewed as a wicked Messianic pretender. Their ethnic brethren were united against them under a false Christ. Another objective of Bar Kokhba's was to capture Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. Jewish Christians obviously gave no support to this either. Jesus had prophesied its destruction. The Apocalypse of Peter presents God as promising Jesus' followers entrance into the heavenly temple. In the end, Hadrian defeated the rabbinic savior. The loss of life on both sides was enormous. Judea was renamed Palestina after the Philistines, Israel's ancient enemy. Abrahamic Jerusalem would remain pagan alia capitolina until the time of Constantine. 
Jews were forbidden to enter Jerusalem or the neighboring area, a, a prohibition that would stand until the end of Roman rule in Palestine, when the armies of Islam took the city 500 years later. The ban also applied to Jewish Christians. After the war, there were no longer Hebrew bishops of Jerusalem, but only Gentile bishops of Aelia Capitolina. From this time forward, Jewish Christians play a minor role in our story, popping up infrequently here and there. Jerusalem, as a center of Christianity, decreased in importance. The church at large would no longer look to the holy city for leadership and guidance as they once had. What happened to the Jewish Christian survivors? As I alluded to earlier, the two groups of Jewish Christians that appear in subsequent history are the Nazarenes and the Ebionites. The Ebionites were a heretical group of Judaizers. Their origins perhaps lie in the schismatic Thebothus, or even earlier, with the Judaizers the Apostle Paul had to combat. The Ebionites rejected Paul and all his teachings. To them, he was the arch-heretic. They held to the Gospel of Matthew in its original Aramaic version. They believed that both Jews and Gentiles needed to keep the Torah to be justified. Finally, they denied the divinity of Christ and the virgin birth. To the Ebionites, Jesus was a mortal man, the natural son of Joseph and Mary, and adopted by God as his son during his baptism. The reason they rejected the virgin birth, besides rejecting Jesus' divinity, was the importance of Jesus' biological descent from David. If Joseph was a descendant of David, then Jesus needed to be his natural son, to also be the son of David. That is who the Ebionites were. The other group was the Nazarenes. The Nazarenes, while they kept the Torah, did not believe Gentiles needed to keep it. As far as doctrine was concerned, they were in agreement with the church at large. They accepted Jesus' divinity and the Apostle Paul. The Nazarenes were thus the descendants of the Apostolic Jewish Church, led by James and Simeon and Justus. What happened to them? Well, they moved again, this time up north into Syria. Berea in Col Syria, Aleppo, and Laodicea by the river Orontes. Laodicea is below a coastal mountain range, which is still known today as the Valley of the Nazarenes. The subsequent history of the Nazarenes is one of the most tragic outcomes of the so-called parting of ways between Christianity and Rabbinic Judaism. While the rabbis hated them as traitors and heretics, slowly over time, Gentile Christians would begin to regard them as heretics too, because of their observance of Mosaic law. While some early Gentile writers regarded the Nazarenes as part of the church, as the centuries progressed, more would come to see them as schismatics. We will see this shift in future episodes. Speaking of the parting of ways, the Bar Kokhba revolt represents a turning point in the relationship between Christianity and Judaism. Now, in recent decades, historians have moved away from the parting of ways perspective where Jews and Christians split from each other very clearly in the 2nd century. Instead, scholars today tend to emphasize how Jews and Christians continue to interact and influence one another. Well into the 4th century, Christians would still be attracted to Judaism. There are instances where ordinary Christians and Jews, despite the wishes of bishops and rabbis, mingled with one another even leading to degrees of religious syncretism. But despite all this, it is hard not to see the Bar Kokhba revolt as the culmination of deteriorating Jewish-Christian relations. Jesus had disputed Judaism with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Some among these groups became enemies of his and were highly involved in his crucifixion as a false prophet and messianic pretender. 
The subsequent gospel proclamation by the apostles of his resurrection and the salvation he offered was met by some Jews with acceptance, but others with violence. Paul was repeatedly persecuted across the diaspora. The execution of James the Apostle was met with approval, and the brutal martyrdom of Jesus' brother James demonstrated the depth of this resentment. Non-Christian Jews in Rome distanced themselves from the church, making it easier for Nero to persecute. After the First War, the rabbis were intent on creating a Judaism where Jesus of Nazareth and his followers had no place. Eventually, their views would become the orthodoxy of Judaism. Bar Kokhba put these views into action and persecuted Jewish believers. As time went on, rabbis would create a version of Jesus' life that undermined and cursed him. As we shall see in future episodes, Bar Kokhba's war was not the last time non-Christian Jews would persecute Christians. Combining all this with the ever-increasingly Gentile church, is it any wonder that Judaism and Christianity parted ways? One of the first texts to witness to this so-called parting is the Epistle of Barnabas. Of course, Barnabas clearly did not write it, given the hostility it shows to Judaism and its harsh attitude towards the rituals of Old Testament law. In the Epistle of Barnabas, we see the beginnings of Christian supersessionism, the belief that the church has replaced the Jews as God's covenant people. The rabbis repudiated any claims by Christians, Gentile or Jewish, to be God's people. Now the church would start to say the same thing back, but in reverse. The calamities of the Jewish wars against Rome served to reinforce this view. If God's people were still the Jews, why did he not save the temple from Titus, or rescue the nation from Hadrian's wrath? This should not be taken to mean all Christian mission to Jews ended. Around the year 140 AD, a Christian named Aristo of Pella wrote a tract called Discussion Between Jason and Papsius Concerning Christ. Only fragments survive, but from later summaries, we learn that Aristo's apology to Jews purports to tell how a Jewish Christian named Jason debates a Jew from Alexandria named Papsius and tries to prove from the Old Testament that Jesus is the Messiah. Papsius is eventually converted and receives baptism. Aristotle's story of a debate between a Jew and a Christian would become a popular device used in later Christian polemics against Judaism. However, as the decades rolled by, the rhetoric of Christian apologetic would steadily become more harsh and aggressive. We will see this as we go on. Next episode, we will take a break from the narrative to discuss a religious movement that will be the greatest set of heresies the church has faced yet. A religious tradition whose interactions with the church fathers would leave a profound mark on Catholic orthodoxy. I am talking, of course, about Gnosticism. Thank you for listening. Please comment, review, and subscribe. You can email me at historyoftheearlychurch at gmail.com and don't forget to check out the website at historyoftheearlychurch.wordpress.com.